And we are live. So, hey, everybody, welcome uh, Monday night here. Uh, so welcome to uh, Breaking Bourbon chat with uh, got some cool guests tonight. So the founders of uh, Whiskey Del Bac, so actually out of uh, Arizona. So much different weather than we're having up here in Syracuse, New York, I'm sure. Huh, Eric? Yeah, we're lucky to we crack 50. Yeah, well, it's like it's 80 and then it snows and then it's 80 again. You know, I think there was one day we had like six inches of snow on the ground. And then uh, the, by the end of the day, it was like 70 degrees. So kind of, kind of weird. We don't have weird. that problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so exciting, uh, exciting chat tonight. Um, so, uh, you know, kind of get around the, get around the room, introduce everybody. So uh, folks know me, I am Nick from uh, Breaking Bourbon. Uh, one of the three guys who founded Breaking Bourbon, breakingbourbon.com. Uh, Eric is here as well. So, hey, Eric. Hello. And uh, Jordan, the third member, uh, could not make it tonight. Uh, and then uh, we've got Michael from the Prime Barrel. So, hey, Michael, how are you doing? Hey, guys. Good to be here. Uh, always great time collaborating with you guys and uh, just joining these chats. Uh, looking forward to this one. Yeah, so we were talking a little before, so talking about backgrounds here. So Michael's going to be filling his background with bottles as we as we go on bottles of Del Bac, I think. Uh, I will just be holding here. these the entire show. I think yeah, that I'll speak for you, rotating so. those kinds of things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, last but not least, so the the co-founders of uh, Whiskey Del Bac, Hamilton Distillers, uh, Stephen and Amanda Paul. So actually, before we get into Whiskey Del Bac, I just want you guys to introduce yourselves and actually each of you answer a question. Then then I'm going to have Amanda. I want you to put a twist on your answer to it too. So okay. if each of you guys could introduce yourself and then tell us kind of like your first experience with whiskey. And then uh, because you guys are a father daughter uh, duo, I'm kind of curious if uh, Amanda's first experience was, 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 was known to you, Stephen, at the time or not. So <laughs> go ahead, Stephen, you first. Uh, sure, yeah, um, <coughs> excuse me. I um, was always a wine and beer drinker until my, I wet, met my wife, Elaine, Amanda's mom. And um, she introduced me to, to uh, single malt scotch. Um, and so that was, you know, many, many years ago. Um, and so then I just kind of got, you know, fascinated. I'm, I'm not a hugely knowledgeable about, you know, single malts um, as in the broad spectrum. Um, but but yeah, that's how I that was my first experience was with my my wife exposing me to good single malt scotch. She exposed you to a lot of really good things, actually. <laughs> she, did, yeah. um, Clearly and, she was a keeper. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and you know, I'm Amanda. Um, this is my father, and we founded this company together. Mm -hmm. um, and I really didn't kind of make the foray into brown spirits until later in life. Um, I've always been kind of a, a beer and wine drinker myself. Um, so when I was, you know, drinking in high school, it wasn't the good stuff, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I, I'm still learning too. You know, I, I probably am the least knowledgeable person on the team when it comes to aged spirits. So always still learning for sure. Yeah, that's the great thing about about whiskey, right? And actually is speaking of, you know, learning. So we're going to we're going to taste a little bit too. So we're going to talk about whiskey del Bac, but also, you know, we picked a, a, a single malt barrel recently, which is available, still some bottles available through the wine spot. OK, and so I can say it's our first single malt uh, that, we, that we picked, at least the first one like this. And, you know, I'm learning about single malts and, and we actually, Eric and I toured a, a facility here in New York that actually uh, creates malts, all kinds of different flavors, all that. The range is, is absolutely just incredible. Um, so we'll be talking about some of that too. So before we get into our, our pick, guys, why don't you tell us about, about Whiskey Del Bac? What, what inspired you to create this, you know, this brand, this company? And, and what are you guys doing that's unique and different? Well, so this whole whiskey project started um, really um, out of a kind of profound sense of place uh, with the Sonoran Desert. Um, and uh, 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 Amanda's mom, Elaine, and I had a um, custom uh, furniture design company for 30 years that specialized in mesquite wood. Mesquite, the grain of mesquite is 
is really, really beautiful. Um, and um, and that, that furniture company kind of grew out of the same notion of creating something that was from the Sonoran Desert. Um, and, uh, but there's a fair amount of, uh, you know, scrap um, or waste uh, involved in dealing with mesquite wood to m turn it into fine furniture because it's full of uh, defects, essentially, cracks, knots, wormholes, which you can use to your advantage visually. Um, they can look just fantastic, um, but it generates a lot of waste. So I would always take my scraps home to barbecue with um, and I would always tell Elaine, um, those are our profits going up in smoke. Um, and uh, one night in late 2006, we're drinking scotch and barbecuing, and she, and she goes, why couldn't you dry malt over a mesquite fire instead of a peat fire like we do in Scotland? And so I was captivated by that idea, um, got a little five-gallon still from Portugal, a little alembic still, started, you know, exploring how to make whiskey because I knew nothing. I wasn't even a, a, a you know, a home brewer um, <clears throat> and started tasting good. And then in 2011, I bought a, a, a 40 gallon still and hoped to go into kind of official product development phase on that still. And Amanda had been living for 10 years in New York City and um, had just moved home. And we would always give tours of the wood shop and I was going to set this one thing up in the wood in a partitioned area off the wood shop and so she knew people would see this thing and she she goes dad um I think we better get you legal um <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask you at what point was this legal <laughs> yeah, yeah 2011 <laughs> and right. it's an easy thing to do covertly in you know like a high traffic <laughs> area <laughs> Yeah, on your so, front porch, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, like a lemonade stand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that. And so she kind of initiated the the the, the legitimacy of the of the project. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, you know, formed a little LLC, went through all the hoops to get licensed, you know, locally and on the state level and with the feds. Um, and went into product development phase and took product off that 40 gallon still to the local Tucson marketplace. And it was very um, warmly received. And then we got funding in 2014. I, I kept running the furniture business and uh, mm -hmm. Amanda was doing interior design and other design related projects here in Tucson. Um, but in 2014, we got funding to put in a 500 gallon system with a 5,000 pound capacity malt, malt house. Um, and so we you know, became operational on that uh, system in, in December of 14. And one of the things that um, is kind of unusual about us is that we, we malt our own barley for, the, for our mesquited um, Dorado. Um, and so I had to learn how to malt um, because there, you know, I couldn't find any mesquite smoked malt um, at the time. At the time, actually, yeah. now like Brees and a couple of other uh, big malting companies do a mesquited malt. But um, but anyway, so yeah, that's so I was floor malting little seventy pound batches, um, and to serve that forty gallon still. And so we put in a five thousand pound system and it's a tank based system, um, three foot deep grain beds. So we're saving a lot of floor space. We're able to mm -hmm. mold that large of a batch in a 10 foot diameter footprint. And water, you know, floor malting mm -hmm. in the desert where it's, you know, can be 110 degrees and 2% humidity. You go through a lot of water. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and it's a prototype system, which I feel like you should. Yeah. So it didn't, on. didn't really exist anymore for, so we, we um, used a, a fabricator in Portland, Oregon uh, called, at that time it was called uh, Global, Global Stainless Systems. And they really helped design the system. We, we borrowed from some, um, you know, existing technology um, and put it, put it all together in a tank. Um, and so that, you know, that's kind of what we ended up with. And it's doing, it's making really good malt for us. 
Did you did you guys find that malt side to be challenging, or did you find that you kind of eased into that pretty well, and it was straightforward to do? Um, it was hard. Um, it's super, you know, complicated, and um, you have to. So you know you're, what you're looking for when you're malting is the you're germinating barley, and by the way, all grains create the enzyme that'll turn starch to sugar, which is officially malt in that, you know, grain. Um, so we're looking for a little, the growth of a little shoot that grows up on the inside of each kernel mm -hmm. on the acrospire. And when that acrospire is like 70% the length of the kernel itself, that's when we know it's got the enzyme. Um, you can tell when you open it too, if you kind of mm -hmm. roll it in your hand, it'll, the inside will have like the texture of, toothpaste kind of, yeah. so there are a couple yeah. indicators that tell you it's it's ready to to you know to halt the process and start kilning it yeah but there's a to answer your question there's a lot that can go wrong and without going into all of it um it was the learning curve was pretty steep um now we've got it dialed in really well um and uh so yeah it was a, it was a hard thing to to get down but um but now, now it's going great. There's a lot, you know. There's a lot more control to be had on the on the GK. We call it the germination kilning tank because mm. um, it's a dual purpose tank. It's enclosed, so you know we can know what the temperature is. You know we have a lot more mm. sensors, but you know, like anything with you know, the more mechanical elements you have, like the more room there is for things to go wrong, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, I think, I think we're making better malt than we ever have because we have so much more control. Um, but, you know, I think floor malting is easier in a sense. <laughs> mm, yeah. And more straightforward. Yeah. 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 And, and I've always heard, I mean, as far as what you see, as far as grains go for, for whiskey grains, bourbon grains and so forth, malt is, is typically referred to as the most expensive, I think, just about everywhere regionally. And so why you tend to not necessarily see high malt per se or why distillers may want to try to work with a lower amount of malt and not even necessarily use it for flavoring grain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I should probably use that little point of departure to just kind of define what a single malt is. Probably most of your, your viewers know what a single malt is, but just to make sure, um, it's there's kind of two main things that define a, a, a single malt whiskey. The first one is that it's 100% barley malt mash bill or recipe. So whereas a bourbon only has to be 51% grain, um, same thing with rise and, and, and other um, whiskeys according to the, the TTB. But 100% but barley malt mash bill for a single malt and then all made in a single distillery. So no source from, you know, alcohol from any other distillery. Um, whereas like blended scotches, um, like a Dewar's, uh, Johnny Walker, a Chivas, those um, folks are buying from uh, multiple distilleries that they've been buying from for decades and decades. Mm -hmm. They know the product really well. They're really good whiskeys. Um, and they're, you know, blending those together to, you know, a very, and, and it's all very predictable because they know those sources. Um, but anyway, those are blended with blended uh, scotches and a single malt is all from one distillery. So now with a single malt, can it be multiple types of malt from that one distillery? Um, it has to be barley malt, mm -hmm. um, but it could be different types of bar barley malt. Right. Um, yeah. But right. Like you could, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm looking because I remember, as I mentioned before, we went to a, you know, a malt house, you know, and we came away with three different, you know, more or less cool. flavors, which yeah. we had, we had chosen from many we brought it down to I think seven, and then we went upstairs and steeped it like tea, uh, and then tasted each more or less each as a tea using, you know, using the malt. And we ended up with a light, a dark, uh, a light, a medium, and a dark. But they each had their own flavor characteristics, which were 
dramatically different across mm -hmm. the spectrum um, from one to the next, just based on the uh, manufacturing process that they had, you know, you know, put into each of these to try to get the chocolate notes out or, you know, or, or like a sharper, stronger note or more pungent note or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we could do that. Um, we, we don't, but we could. Um, as long as it's bar all barley malt, you know, mash, mash bill. Um, I, I should point out that we only malt for our mesquited whiskeys. Um, and so for our, our classic, uh, un, un, you know, unsmoked whiskey, which is what you guys got in your, in your barrel. Um, we actually use commercial malt for that. Because um, I realized a couple of years ago that we, we were malting everything and it's super, super labor intensive. <laughs> yeah. A little bit, yeah. 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 So, um, but anyway, yeah, all grain to glass um, and, um, and, um, you know, so all, all made in a single distillery. I have to ask, uh, so clearly there's a big difference in taste in, in tasting profile between bourbons and single malts, but even within single malts family, right? There are a wide array, wide spectrum of how they might taste. Do you guys have a specific profile that you're going after? I understand batch to batch, they're going to be different, but do you have a specific profile that you try to kind of like, like that you use as a litmus test to say, yeah, that's what we want our whiskey to taste like? Yeah, so actually the classics um, was the first thing I did to just learn how to make a single malt, malt whiskey before before knowing anything and before introducing any kind of uh, mesquite component. Um, and my model was actually the Macallan 12 year. Um, and that's because I that was my go-to whiskey um, when I was out to dinner because it's widely available, um, pretty good single malt and reasonably priced. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was targeting that as not for exact flavor profile, but for caliber. Um, I wanted to achieve that kind of quality. Um, I have, just as a quick aside, uh, my, that's not my go-to anymore. Um, now I've gravitated, if they don't sell, if they don't stock Whiskey Del Bac, I'll order the Balveni 12 year, just FYI. But, um, but anyway, the McAllen's really good and that's what was kind of what I was shooting for. And so then when we had that dialed in, we were, were looking for that consistency. Mm -hmm. um, and batches will, vary a little bit, but we're really, um, you know, from batch to batch, we're pretty consistent. Yeah. Um, and so that's, we're trying to be at least, you'll yeah. have to let us know if, if we fail at that at some point. But I think for our core skews, we're, we're really aiming to keep it consistent. Um, you know, for the, yeah. you know, that's a little bit, to be a little bit more playful. Um, but yeah, we're, we're aiming for consistency. It's, I think it's taken us a while to get there. Um, but yeah, I, I think Stephen's palate explains a lot because that's exactly what my go to would be. If okay. uh, I like Balmini, uh, I definitely like Del Bug, but I have a soft spot for single malts. Um, that's how I got into the whiskey. And there are, as I'm listening to you talk, to you two guys talk, there are parallels galore, not just between Amanda and New York and Amanda knowing uh, our, you know, little store when we just opened up, but also with the Breaking Bourbon guys, like uh, we, I, you know, I've always been a fan of single malts and I've always been a fan of uh, grain to glass. And so in our local backyard, there's a company called Hill Rock. I'm sure you guys heard. Yes. Mm -hmm. Breaking Bourbon guys definitely heard because we've introduced them to that company they picked a barrel and that bottle actually won a gold medal at, I think it was San Francisco, right guys? San oh, Francisco. awesome. Yeah. Cool. yeah. And, and, and so when I tasted yours, um, I was like, I was blown away. I was like, well, this is just as good. Uh, it's different, but it's just as good. And I enjoyed both sets of samples that you guys sent to us. And they were so good. I reached out to Nick and I said, look, uh, I, have the, I have this company. You probably never heard of them but would you mind tasting um, the samples? And at that point, I already knew that we liked one set of samples over the other, 
but by the very slimmest of margins, like very, like, uh, yeah. you know, in, in blind tasting, you probably wouldn't be able to pick them. Um, and we sent both set of samples to Nick. I didn't say anything to them. And they picked the one uh, that, they picked the other one, essentially. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, all right, that settles it. We're going to get ours and they're going to get theirs. Oh, and that's how the two picks got, you know, came about. So it's just amazing how, um, you know, we have some, yeah, you know, yeah, we have some similarities in what we like, and then um, you know the, the Breaking Bourbon guys, uh, uh, you know, inclusion in all of this kind of yeah. like closes the loop. Yeah, so. yeah, you know, I, I think I think we ended up going for one that was, I guess, almost like less scotch, slightly less scotch, like I think by comparison. And we went for the one that was actually more scotch. Yeah, yeah. and I think yeah. that's the uh, difference. You know, we're thinking about. Yeah you know, thinking about our, our club members too, and, you know, mostly bourbon palettes. And so I think, I think single malt is an interesting transition from bourbon and especially American single malt, um, because a lot of those flavors, what I found, and, and you guys can maybe comment on the single malt landscape of American single malts in a sense, because that seems like a, a growing, but still very small and somewhat untapped, um, market and people are kind of trying to define what's what you know within that and trying to find the mark of you know of the audience and those kinds of things you know bourbon rye i think we kind of think of those two synonymously um you know if you're a bourbon fan you're probably a rye fan too whereas single malt i think is still an area that a lot of bourbon drinkers maybe have not ventured into but i think once they do they find there's really a lot a lot to love there some of them they may not enjoy, especially those ones that go a little too far and kind of reach into the deeper flavor profiles that you might find in scotch. But I think a lot of them will, will appeal to like a bourbon fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. My, Michael, do you want to tackle that, the landscape of single malts first? <laughs> I can start too, but. Uh, go, go ahead. Uh, you know about it much more than I do. I, I, I can I can talk to it in just in, in, in terms of the retail perspective and in terms of marketability perspective. It's nowhere near, obviously, bourbons or even scotches for that matter. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very uh, niche. It's a, it's a niche. Right. So and it, and it has their fans. Uh, and I feel like the fandom is slowly growing as for, for different reasons. Uh, the, the bourbon craze, uh, you know, some 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 bottles are just being priced out of you know, from being everyday drinkers. Um, you know, if you've never been a scotch guy, you're not all of a sudden going to be one right now. And I think American malls fit somewhere in between, whereas it's something different, right? If you actually want to try something that tastes great, but not quite bourbon uh, and not quite scotch, but, you know, fills that uh, gap between the two, it's a perfect spirit to try. And it has depth of flavors, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the thing that I personally don't like about scotch, and I know I'm going to get some slack for it, I don't like peaty, peaty scotches. Like just mm -hmm. not my thing. It's yeah. an acquired taste. Uh, some people I know love and swear by it. It's just not me. And your product, and neither was Hillrack for that matter, uh, it's far from that. It, it's mm -hmm. it's more, um, you know, if you, if you grade it on the spectrum, it's more closely uh, aligned to bourbon than it is to scotches. Uh, mm -hmm. Yet it has that uh, that barley presence in it, uh, and so it definitely has the notes of single malt, uh, but it's nowhere near, uh, you know, your 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 uh, Lagavulins or whatnot. It's it's just not that uh, peaty, and it's very approachable. Um, and and I remember, like I remember, I was tasting just as if it was yesterday. I remember vividly tasting coffee notes, toffee notes, and caramel notes, and those three notes you can easily mm -hmm. find in good bourbons as well. Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah. so that's, that's the parallel to me. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, the, the, so I've never been a fan of those heavily peated Isla scotches either. And because of that iodine astringency that they give you, um, some people characterize it as band-aid. Band -aid, yeah. 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 Um, and I find that um, with our mesquite whiskey, um, mesquite is a lot softer on the palate than, than peat. Um, but but to go into the kind of single malt, uh, American single malt world a little bit, um, there's a ton of um, kind of innovation going on, mm. um, like, and, and regionalism, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Westland, like Westland, yeah, Westland yeah. up in Seattle mm -hmm. um, is 
digging, they don't malt their own barley, but they, they're digging up Washington peat, sending that off to be, um, to, to, to uh, smoke over the uh, malt. And um, they're also using a, a native oak for barrels up there. I mean, it's kind of limited, but. Really cool stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Balcones mm -hmm. down in Texas is doing some regional stuff. Um, you know, people are using, and even in crossing over, I'll just expand this a little bit into bourbons. I, as you guys know this really well, but all kinds of bourbons are using like heritage corn varieties. Mm -hmm. um, and I think some people are smoking bourbons. Um, and so the landscape is really fun right now in terms of just the broader sector of, of American uh, craft whiskeys. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as single malts go, first of all, we're not officially recognized as right. a category by the TTB. <laughs> Um, we're trying to make that happen, and about, we've been trying too. <laughs> yeah, and actually, the guys at Westland uh, Distillery up in Seattle have been spearheading um, the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission, which is awesome. And we're actually having our second general meeting um, on Thursday. Um, but the goal is to get the TTB to recognize us and also to elevate the public's awareness of. Uh, of you know single malt whiskey in America, mm -hmm. um, so but there's there's only so as far as we know we're one of only about you know just a handful. I only think I only know of like six distilleries in the country that is solely devoted to Amer American single malts. So we don't make any gin or vodka or, or rum or bourbon. Um, however, in the commission. Um, the membership consists of about 140 yeah. single malt producers. So there's quite a, quite a, you know, big, um, you know, number of, of distilleries making American single malt. Probably uh, many of whom also make bourbon. So uh, yeah. a, good, yeah. a good gateway for the bourbon mm -hmm. drinker who's familiar with the brand already. Yeah. So what yeah. do you gain? You, you just mentioned awareness uh, from making single malt recognized by the TTB. What else, what else is the goal of that process? What does single malt or American single malt gain to get that kind of recognition that it doesn't have right now? With the public? Yeah, yep. Yeah, in general. So you're right now it's not really defined by TTB. What do we gain ultimately by having TTB define that category more clearly? Well, I think, you know, every, and as you guys all know, and Michael, especially, um, you know, it's all about um, market um, market share and shelf space. And consumer understanding, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but for, you know, for the longest time, you'd go into a retail store and, you know, there'd be a section for, you know, bourbons, rise, and then they wouldn't know where to put single malts. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they just kind of like stick us where we fit. Um, and I think that that's, that's for sure changing now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I go into retail stores all the time that have, you know, an American single malt section, which is so exciting. Um, but, you know, I think the, the feds recognizing the category would further, you know, catapult that and kind of normalize it. But I think, you know, one of the positives would just be, you know, kind of education on a spirits level. You know, we meet so many people that, you know, love bourbon and love rye, but don't mm -hmm. know what makes a bourbon a bourbon and a rye a rye. Yeah. Um, so I think that it just kind of, it opens up the conversation in general um, for the brown spirits category to really understand what the differences are. Um, because a lot of people don't don't know. And you I can tell you from I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was gonna say from the retail perspective, I can tell you this much. Uh, when we bring stuff into the store, obviously we think about well, how easy is it gonna be to move, right? I and mean, I'm not there to sit on a product. But at the same time, we at, at least us, we're all whiskey fans first. And we bring things that we like, like we taste everything that comes into our shop. And I find with single malts, it's a hand salt. 
essentially when someone comes in and he looks at your wall of whiskey and it, unless they know exactly what they want, that's a different story. But if they want to, to, to try something new, it takes one of us to come in and to recommend and maybe even have them taste it. And once they do, they're like, oh, this is great. What is this? I've never heard about this. And, and so there is this component of education that needs to happen. Uh, whereas in bourbon and scotch, like it's well known. Uh, you don't, right. we, we're past that. Yeah. Totally. I was just going to say too, um, you'd be amazed at how many people like on tours or, or that just come into our distillery, whatever, say, say, are you a bourbon or are you a whiskey? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and then so we gently try to tell them that bourbon is whiskey. All whiskeys are made from grain. You know, anyway, so there's a lot of education yeah. that we're always trying to do. And I'm, you know, like you having, you know, uh, in your store setting. Yeah, you know. Are mm -hmm. all about educating. Mm -hmm. um, and so Honestly, that's that, that's a favorite part of the job. If I can turn somebody into a anything else but bourbon and scotch drinker, and they actually stick to it and they come in the next time and ask for it, that's the job well done for me. Because now I've expanded that person's horizons. And so, oh, so the next time he comes in, he's more likely to try new stuff. And that's yeah, what we're all about. We yeah. want to expose our members, our customers into into wonders of whiskey, if you will. Yeah. 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 It's fun. It's fun. Yeah. Actually. And and really that question is a you know, you, it's it's always kind of fun when someone asks that question because it's an opportunity to like, you know, raise that person's awareness and like and they've asked a question, so they are curious. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. start. And curiosity yeah. start, right? A yeah. good thing. Uh, you know, from, from picking your specific brand, I got to say one more thing. Uh, part of it was that not too many people were picking it. And and I'm like, well, we are going to be the first ones. I, I don't care if it just sits on my shelf. I like the product and I'm going to drink them all if I have to. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, that's not going to happen. We only have a few left between, you know, the Breaking Bourbon guys pick and our pick. Oh, cool. um, but but the you know people that haven't bought and maybe were on the fence about it now they have more information about both um and hopefully um they're you know they're, they're willing to make that they're, they're willing they're willing to take a chance and buy it and that's yeah. the best yeah. way to do it yeah. yeah so that's a that's a good transition my in my glass i i poured a little i'm going to pour a little more um of of this pick uh, and eric i think you were drinking some a minute ago too so eric why don't you kick it off tell everybody about you know a little bit about this particular pick that we did um yeah and i i kind of wanted to interject too is can you guys we didn't really get to this at the beginning can you explain to us your different expressions just for the people that don't know because you have a couple different ones especially the distiller cut in, in particular i like to learn a little bit more about and you know the yeah. age range and that sort of thing you're kind of targeting right now sure you um want to take that? sure um, so the first thing I did was the, the, the whiskey Delbach classic mm -hmm. and again, it's not, um, mesquited. And so it's really patterned after a space side scotch, like a, like a Macallan. Um, and then we have our, um, our, our mesquited Dorado. And by the way, I've, we're really trying hard to introduce the term mesquited into the national vocabulary. And wine enthusiasts just picked it up a couple of months ago. So we, that was our first. Yeah, like, we had our first yeah. published. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, but um, so so the we call it the Whiskey Delbach Dorado, and that's our mesquited whiskey. We have um, an unaged mesquited whiskey that we that I never planned on bottling. It's called our Old Pueblo. It's really not for a retail setting. It's it's primarily used in cocktails. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's basically what goes into the barrel to make the Dorado. Um, but actually appeals to mezcal drinkers, you know, for people that don't want to use it for cocktail purposes. We find that the mezcal crowd gravitates heavily towards the old Pueblo because it has the, you know, the mesquite quality, but it's also like very vegetal and grassy. Um, it's, it's not your typical white whiskey. Yeah. Um, hmm. also but it is. I'm, I'm curious about that. I love Mascal. So it has to so up my alley. We'll send you some. Yeah. We should, we could send you guys some little, you know, hundred mil bottles. Yeah. We'll um, send you some to, it's to interesting. taste and play with. Um, but people it, either love it or hate it, you know, yeah. much like the desert, you know, it's like <laughs> super fan or it's not for you. <laughs> um, 
but it is it is a hundred percent barley malt uh, mash, you know, recipe. So, mm -hmm. um, and some people have characterized it as, like Amanda said, as a mezcal drinker's whiskey. Yeah. But but anyway, and then we have um, our distillers cut um, program, which is we typically release four distillers cut blends a year. Um, they are always aged in new oak, whether it's mesquited or or unmesquited. Mm -hmm. And then finished in um, X, you know, sometimes X bourbon cask. Um, we are sherry, sherry, uh, Calvados cask, Madeira. Um, Madeira. Our current one that we just bottled uh, Friday, and we're going to release in a couple of weeks, is uh, finished in X um, Sautern cask. So it's always something that's different, and it's always cask strength. Um, like you, the barrels that you guys got. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. always, um, you know, basically an exercise in the art of blending. Our goal was to uh, showcase how great an Ameri a cast strength American single malt whiskey can be. And so that, that's our distiller's cut. And they're really fun. It adds a whole really fun element to our core lineup. And because we're so like myopic mm -hmm. in our production, because we, you know, only focus on... American single malt. It's kind of our, you know, our moment to play with other things um, mm -hmm. and to be a little bit adventurous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you don't see a lot of cast strength single malts just in general compared to bourbon. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. why do you think that is? Uh, I'm not sure, but that's one of the reasons we started doing it. Um, we may have been the first um, <clears throat> company to come out with a cast strength single malt, American single malt. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's true. I or don't not, know that we were the first, <clears throat> but we were definitely like, you know, one of four or three. Yeah. Um, Very short list. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And I don't know why that is because, the, you know, there's so much we love it. And I think consumers love it because, you know, you, you bottle at that high proof. <clears throat> And then, you know, to kind of distill it down with droplets of water, you get to go through so many different, you know, taste ranges and it changes so much. Um, so it's, you know, for a spirits drinker, it's such a fun thing to have in the house because mm -hmm. it's such an experience mm -hmm. to, you know, put an ice cube in it and see how it totally opens up and, you know. So I don't know why that is. But I think part of it may be that, um, you know, single malt, American single malt producers have just been kind of scrambling to figure out what they're doing um, before, you know, so they just didn't get around to doing a, a cast strength expression. But hopefully we see more of it, though. Yeah. Yeah. It came. Yeah. I feel like it came to bourbon late. Too, and then suddenly mm. it's it, it was like dominoes and now you see it everywhere and that's what everybody wants or everybody has at least one expression of it or taking their standard products and creating an expression from it so maybe you're just ahead of where american single malt is going to be in five or ten years once the market kind of catches up mm -hmm. catches up yeah yes american mm -hmm. single malts were kind of the group that's late to the party mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> But so, I mean, I, so the question could come back to you guys. I mean, you decided to like, you know, acquire um, uh, cast strength single malt whiskey. Why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you guys want to take it? I think it's yeah. an easy answer. So yeah. part of it is we, we haven't had much of it and felt adventurous and wanted to explore it. Yeah. That's yeah. certainly one reason. I, I'll tell you mine. My reason is simply what Amanda just said. You can always distill it down. You yeah. can go the other way. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to be adventurous, and let's be honest, people that try this stuff and buy this stuff now at this stage of the game are adventurous. They want to experiment with this. So I don't want to prevent them from doing that. So mm -hmm. that's that was the sole reason we did, we, we went for gas train. And I think what you find with barrel clubs too is by and large, a lot of barrel clubs are enthusiasts and enthusiasts want the higher proof. You know, they're people that are, are not just mixing with it or, you know, they really want to experience different flavors and try new things. That's the reason they're in a barrel club in the first place. You know, that's the reason we're interested in this in the first place, because I talk about it sometimes, you know, 
bourbon as a category actually I feel like doesn't have a ton of range in and of itself. Um, whereas uh, that's why you're seeing the finishes now with bourbon and those kinds of things. I think the single malt category has a lot more, a lot more range, so to speak. And I think that's also, it's, it's both a gift and a curse because I think the problem is, is if somebody tries something in the single malt side and they really don't like it, that could turn them off mm -hmm. yeah. from single malts, you know, the same way with like a, a really heavily peated scotch, for example, that can be disgusting uh to a lot of people <laughs> they might turn them off to, i mean that could turn yeah. them off completely whereas i feel like with bourbon you really don't have aside from finishes you really don't have anything that's too far outside of that norm you know so if you know it's bourbon and it's not finished in something and you have a general idea of the age you have some idea of what it's going to taste like you know based on that it's within that category of i guess what you're expecting whereas with mm -hmm. single malt I'm not sure you can really say that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I do wanna, um, so I, I, I can, um, you know, sound like I'm disparaging um, heavily peated scotches <laughs> too. No, you're not. <laughs> but, but I wanna make sure that, I, that we're not doing that because like I have a ton of, well, you know, there's millions of people in the world that love those Isla scotches. I do. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, for all of you out there listening, um, that's a thing. It's a real thing. It's just that some it's, people don't. It's just not your thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or, right. Right. There are Michaels. Yeah. So. <laughs> Sometimes you have to remind people everybody's tastes are different. And just because I like something or Eric likes something doesn't mean that you, you know, have to like it. You know, we all, if you ask anyone what their favorite food is, chances are you're not going to find too many people who say the same thing unless it's a group right. of like six-year-olds. And then the first person to say something just so happens that's everyone else's favorite food in the group that day. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the thing to remember is, and you don't know until you really, until you start trying stuff. And we had some great feedback within our group too, with this, you know, with this particular pick. Cause I think, I think a lot of people who bought it really bought into the unexpected, you know, they didn't really know what it was going to taste like. And I think we, you know, we heard from a lot of people that were really pleasantly surprised that maybe now kind of like turned on to this idea of, you know, of an American single malt and looking for something outside of that traditional bourbon category. Yeah. 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 Can we talk about something fun for a second? Um, I know we're almost. <laughs> so I, I, I am, I'm a huge tater sticker fan. Uh, so it fascinates me to see like, and not so much for the sticker itself, but for people's creativity and, you know, why do they create a sticker and put it in the bottle? And honestly, like, I don't even know how it started. I think it's just, it started as a differentiation uh, mm. mechanism and it just, grew a life on its own. So uh, guys, do you want to talk about your label first? And then I'll talk about ours. <laughs> I'll let Eric, uh, go ahead, Eric. <laughs> All right. How, where did I come up with this? Um, I think it's, it's so much of what we're talking about with the, the cast strength, uh, the, the, that it's cast strength and the high proof. And it, when you, when you tasted it, it just, it has a, you know, a punch to it, a little more grit to it, a little more texture to it. So I, I kind of built off of that and, you know, the whole like cowboy kind of wild west thing, you know, the, the Western America, you know, the true grit attitude. So I kind of just pulled all that together and came up, you know, and used some of those Arizona style colors, um, you know, and, and then just the, the little bit of roughness of the overprint and everything to the sticker too. Mm hmm Awesome. Cool. Uh, our heads were in the same place, Eric. I can tell you that much. Um, one of my favorite books ever is, um, you know, Ray Bradbury, Fahrenheit. Uh, I love it. So we, and, and he's got ties to Tucson, right? So we wanted to kind of play homage to him and to Arizona and to Tucson specifically. So on our label, I don't know if you guys can see it. Uh, it's made in a form oh, yeah, of a yeah. cover, cover of the book. And, you know, the, it's, it's a play on his cover. You know, one of the print versions had this flame, but instead of the bottles at the, uh, on the bottom here, it had books. So we replaced them with bottles. There is an outline of Arizona's desert. It's hard to see on here. Oh. And there's a seal of approval. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's our idea of, uh, you know, playing homage to Tucson and to him and to you guys. 
So we, we can't talk to you guys without talking about the desert. Is that such a huge thing of where you guys are located? You know, how does that affect aging your whiskey and making your whiskey versus, you know, Westland where they're up in you know, Seattle and it's wet and humid or Hill Rock, who's here in New York, where, it, you know, our winters are extremely long. It that, has really, our climate has a huge effect on our on our, you know, product on the malting um, and the aging for sure. I think probably one of the biggest things is that we have a huge diurnal shift. So, you know, the the high to low temperature in a day can vary 40 degrees, um, which in turn, um, you know, really affects our, our, our barrel process. Um, there's a lot of contra contracting and expanding within the barrel um, and it speeds up our, our aging process mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. So, so high heat. High in heat. general, and then that radical diurnal shift um, is a huge is a huge factor and as well. Low and, humidity and low humidity. Let, yesterday's low hu humidity was four percent. We probably were the same today. The high was I'm going to guess like twenty two percent, and um, so, and it's like that for a lot of the year, um, and so we do lose, you know, a fair amount to, to, angel, to share. angel share. Um, but yeah, so the desert has um, that aspect in terms of maturation. Um, it also, we also, there's also a lot of minerals in our water. Um, and up until the point at which we gauge down the whiskey to put it in the barrel, during the process all prior to that, we're using our municipal water. And so there's a lot of minerals in our water. The, the yeast actually loves the minerals in our water. Um, and I always feel like there's a certain level of minerality to, that you can detect in our whiskey, mm -hmm. um, which makes it, um, you know, somewhat also regional. Um, and, but then, then when we gauge down to go into the barrel, um, we don't want those minerals in our, you know, in our whiskey, actually. Um, so we're using reverse osmosis water to, to um, gauge down to barrel proof and then again to bottle proof when we, when we, when we bottle. Um, but yeah, the, the, the kind of the low humidity, radical diurnal shift, general high temperatures, um, and minerality in the water. I think all those things, uh, you know, and plus the mesquite factor. Yeah. And even... I'm gonna say, some people sometimes you'll you'll detect a little smoke even in our classic, and that could be because you know the mesquite smoke when we're malting is wafting in, and I, I'm sure it you know affects even our classic while it's while it's aging, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, all those things. The desert is a is a is a challenge, um, but it's a you know really cool place to to make whiskey because of the unique uniqueness of it all and it's so beautiful Plus that. <laughs> we love the desert we really do we really do that's saying a lot from someone who lived in new york for a while usually people don't convert i know you know my, my mom's from my mom's from the city and and i went back for school i went to nyu and i i stayed for about 10 years but you know, when I was 18 and I left Tucson, I was really sad to leave. I mean, I knew I wanted to go back east for school, but I've always been a desert kid. Um, so it, it's, I, I love being here. And I get to work with my dad every day. You know, it's awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. You're in it for the process, not for the spoils. And that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, next time, mute. Uh, try that again. So we're getting close <laughs> to the top of the hour here, guys. Yeah. Um, so just before we do wrap this up, guys, tell us kind of a little what's on the horizon for uh, for Delbach. What are we watching mm -hmm. for in the next year, the next five years? What's the long term, you know, vision with you guys, and what should fans be looking out for? Do you have some new distribution plans too. So say that last one again. Do you have some new distribution plans too to kind of out, you know? Um, well, we are work. distributed in 16 states, um, and we're really focusing on Arizona right now, partly because of COVID and we couldn't travel, but, but we're really, we really want to expand 
our market in Arizona. Um, and so that'll continue to be a focus. The biggest thing for me is a little over a year ago, we hired a CEO, which has been a godsend um, for the company and for me. Um, it got too big for us. It, you know, we're not, <laughs> we're not business people. <laughs> yeah, so, so we hired uh, Kent Cheeseman, who had been VP of operations at High West Distilling for, for seven years. Nice. His industry knowledge and kind of managerial skills like far exceed ours. Um, and so we are thrilled. And he's just like a lovely person. He's too. great to work um. with, yeah. <laughs> and he totally gets what we're doing. I mean, you probably know High West has a totally different, um, you know, model. model. Mm -hmm. They and started yeah. sourcing, uh, you know, all their whiskey and are slowly starting to distill their own. But anyway, but anyway, so that's been really key. So we've had a ton of, you know, national exposure and our sales have been growing every year. And so our board of directors, which is really a strong, great, diverse board of directors and Kent have really settled on the notion of building a new distillery um, in probably tw 2023. So right now we are scaling up in our existing facility. We're adding literally in about two weeks, we're gonna have a uh, thousand gallon fermenters arrive where right now we have 500 gallon fermenters. Um, we're up, we're scaling up some of the other tanks, our hot, hot liquor tank and our cold liquor tank and some other things. So we're gonna increase capacity where we're at. And then right after that, or during that time, we're gonna start planning this new distillery. So. And it's going to be a destination uh, distillery in Tucson. We have a couple of places in mind that are awesome. Um, but I think that, you know, for for a distillery that's 100% own make and, you know, doing some cool things like mm -hmm. malting our own barley, using native woods, um, we don't, our current facility is not really a consumer facing facility. We are very much a production facility. So it would be really nice to to have a space where, you know, we could bring people, like people really want to come and see the process because we are doing it all in house and there's some really cool elements to it. So I think, you know, in addition to building a larger facility with, you know, a larger production capacity, being able to, you know, have people come in and host panel discussions and have other single malt producers come down. I mean, we're so education focused. I think that having a platform to really get other craft distillers in to have discussions and tastings is is really a huge a huge part of the vision for us. Yeah. That's exciting. I, I honestly I'm I'm excited about what's in store for the American single malt. Yeah. Know, market. I think there's a lot of great things that are going to happen and it, it it's just like bourbon in the sense too that it's almost like producers and distillers are less in competition with one another and more in collaboration with one another and it's really yeah. a community type of operation with community with your competitors in a way uh, where everybody's kind of striving for really kind of the same thing you know and and obviously everybody tastes each other's products learns from one another you know is excited about other people's successes so sounds like uh, you guys have a lot of great stuff on the horizon yeah and 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 just to piggyback on that quickly it really is such a supportive community i mean we leaned on so many people, other distillers to, to answer questions for us and help us along the way. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would never be where we are today without, you know, a handful of people mm -hmm. that really spent a lot mm -hmm. of time with us, you know, sharing information. Yeah. Um, and a lot of bourbon a distillers, lot, yeah. too, including Kings County, which you guys just did something with, I think. So Great much, folks up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, yeah. They, does so much. Um, so it really is, um, it's especially coming from design, which is like not the most generous um, industry with information. Yeah. <laughs> um, distilling has been a really pleasant surprise. It is a, it is a very special mm -hmm. community. Yeah.
Oh, that's great. Well, we're, we're at the top of the hour here, guys. Um, so we'll kind of wrap it up here. Let everyone kind of, you know, tell everyone where you can find you. Um, let's, uh, let's actually start, uh, Michael, let's start with you. And I know people can find still maybe a few of these left. So why don't you, you know, just kind of your outro where people can find you and where people can find these bottles. Uh, sure. Yeah. So if people log into dewinespot.co, um, on the top menu, you'll well. First of all, you can just search for it on the website. That's the easiest way, probably. But also um, under the whiskey menu, you can look for the prime barrel picks, and in that section, we'll list our picks and also uh, Breaking Bourbon guys' picks as well. And so that's that's where you can find. And like I said, we have a few left. Um, you know, come one, come all. Awesome. So uh, Amanda and Stephen, uh, where can people find you guys and and connect with you guys? Um, we're on Caskers and Drizzly um, and DeWine Spot, and there is a link in our Instagram bio, which will go directly to DeWine Spot and to your private barrel picks. Um, so awesome. that'll be up for a while. So that's an easy way to to get there. And if you do find yourself, does any of any anybody finds themselves in Tucson? Um, we do do tours, and they're really fun. Um, it's fun to see, you know, kind of the process, including the malting, and then sitting down for a little not so formal tasting. Um, <laughs> the best kind. And, yeah. And so we're at whiskeydelbach.com. And you guys, if you ever make it out here, we'd love to show you, you know, show you what we do. And, 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 and Tucson is a really fun, very creative place, too. Mm -hmm. So fun town to visit. Yeah. Come visit. <laughs> yeah, no, well, definitely. The next time I'm there, uh, we'll have to uh, hook up with you guys. Yeah. I almost feel, as sometimes drinking this, I almost feel like I'm tasting flavors of the desert in a sense. Like there's this almost this like chili pepper uh, flavor. Yeah. And I don't know if it's if it's subliminal or or subconscious or what the deal is, but it's uh, it, it's really just a fantastic whiskey. Um, a lot I'm of we, get an ancho chili yes yeah yeah that's yeah. what yep that's exactly i think that's I think we said that when we were picking the barrel picks yes yep. yep all right so eric uh why don't you close it out for breaking bourbon here sure you can find us at breakingbourbon.com uh we update we have reviews every day of the week um what do we got tomorrow we got a, a whistle pig piggyback review coming up so check that mm. out um, and then we got the articles, opinions, and, uh, our release calendar too. You can check that out, uh, for all the new releases coming out this year and next. Um, all right. Cool. Yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Very much. Yeah. Amanda, fun. Steven, uh, great. You know, thank you guys for taking time out to educate everybody. I think this was really fun. Um, you know, interesting, you know, hearing what you guys are up to, you know, we'll, we'll do this again, probably at some point it's, it'll be fun to kind of look back and see, you yeah. know, where you guys were now with your distillery, where you are in the future with future distillery, future of what American single malt looks like. I'm excited for that. Uh, Michael, thank you as always. Um, and, uh, so, Hey, everybody who tuned in, uh, thank you guys for watching everybody have a good night. Awesome. Good night, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. See you. Cheers. Bye-bye.